So for part B, uh, the pho photosynthetic rate determines the supply of energy and substrates for biosynthesis, which in turn influences growth and reproduction. Environmental controls on photosynthetic rate are thus important to physiological ecology. A light response curves show the relationship between light levels and photosynthetic rate. The light compensation point or carbon dioxide uptake is balanced by uh, carbon dioxide loss by respiration. Um, and the saturation point is the point at which photosynthesis no longer increases as light increases. So what this is saying is the light response curve is the overall curve. The compensation point is where carbon dioxide um, released via respiration is equal to carbon dioxide fixed via photosynthesis. So again, at low light levels, plants are consumers of carbon dioxide. Um, uh, sorry, at low light levels, plants are uh, exporters of carbon dioxide and consumers of oxygen, where they hit a compensation point where uh, they're now consuming more carbon dioxide than they're releasing and they're net exporters of oxygen. And the saturation point is where photosynthesis no longer increases as light increases. And so every plant has a maximum amount of photosynthesis it can do um, and it becomes oversaturated with, with light. So the addition of more light, sunnier days, increased light intensity does not result in increased photosynthesis. Uh, plants can acclimatize to changing light intensities with shifts in the light saturation point. This involves morphological changes such as thicker leaves and more chloroplasts and the density of light harvesting pigments um, and enzyme concentrations. This is an example of, um, of that. So here, this is the net photosynthetic uh, uptake rate. This is the light compensation point. Uh, meaning that below this amount of incident light, below this, so light's on the X and net photosynthetic rate is on the Y. Below this amount of light, plants are consumers of oxygen, producers of carbon dioxide. Above this light amount, as light increases, so does the photosynthetic rate. So it's showing a, a, a linear relationship for that early part. Um, of the um, light response curve. So as light's increasing, so is photosynthesis until we start to hit our asthmatope or our, our light saturation point. So at that point, um, at this part of the curve, more light doesn't equal more photosynthesis. And plants can acclimatize for different light, um, for different amounts of incident light. So here's an example of the same plant grown under three different conditions. Uh, one, it's grown under a low light condition, a medium light condition, and a high light condition. In the low light condition, again, we have light here on the X and net photosynthesis on the Y. Plants that are grown in a low light condition hit their light saturation much earlier. They hit their light saturation with what is that, 200 maybe, um, in the light incident units of micromoles per meter squared per second. Um, and so this is the same species of plant, same, in, same genetic individuals, but these, these ones are grown under a low light condition, which likely means they have fewer... Um, uh, fewer chloroplasts, they have less chlorophyll, and what that they they do that because you know having all of this all these chloroplasts um, when they're not producing light energy, you still have to maintain them, right? You still ha they're still respiring. So um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Um, Maybe batteries, it's kind of a bad analogy, but if you have a whole bunch of batteries, you still have to trickle charge them and maintain them, even if you're not using them. Um, or maybe solar voltaic cells on your rooftop, if you could put a whole bunch of there, but 
doesn't really work there's, there's still a marginal cost um but anyway so having a bunch of chloroplasts that aren't being used is still requiring energy to maintain them um, and so if you're in a system that you have very little light you know there's no point in having additional chloroplasts because that's just more um, that you need to maintain where if there's a lot of light then there could be a benefit to that so the plants acclimatize by developing thicker leaves by adding more chlorophyll to those leaves that's what this is showing here so individuals grown in the high light condition um, reach their light saturation much later and they're able to produce vastly more um, uh, carbon they're able to uptake a lot more carbon and so like this individual into low light may not persist for a long time this is sort of a coping mechanism perhaps of dropping a bunch of chloroplasts and hoping you can make it through or maybe how plants alter from uh, summer to winter some photosynthetic bacteria can grow in very low light levels um, and a recent discovery found that chlorophyll absorbs light in the near infrared region which is important for um, particular things that live under water where uh, visible light is absorbed more quickly and infrared light penetrates more deeply this allows uh, cyanobacteria to grow at depth um, underneath photosynthetic cells that absorb uh, red and blue low water availability causes plants to close their um, stomates restricting carbon dioxide so again the stomate opens to let carbon dioxide in and as that happens water um, leaves and so this is a trade-off between water conservation versus energy gain through photosynthesis and evaporative cooling closing stomates will increase the chances of light damage um, and if the calvin benson cycle is not operating energy accumulates in the light harvesting arrays and can damage membranes plants have various mechanisms to dissipate this um, energy as heat including um, carotenoid pigments temperature influences photosynthesis um, it affects the rates of, of chemical reactions and it affects the substrate of the membranes and enzymes um, plants in different climate zones have enzymes with different optimal temperatures and they can acclimatize by synthesizing different enzyme forms this is just saying actually oops sorry uh, this graph shows it better uh, with temperature on the X and photosynthetic rate on the Y. These are four different um, genera of plants that have adapted to operating in different temperatures. And so they have different enzymes. Um, uh, and uh, because of that, those enzymes are have different temperature efficiencies. So you can think of this as uh, if a warm weather plant is in a cold environment, what's happening is those enzymes are more fluid, they're, they're adapted to working at a higher temperature. When that temperature slows down, so does the function of those enzymes. Similarly, if you're a cold weather plant and you move to a warm environment, you sort of overheat. Those, those uh, compounds are probably, those enzymes are more sensitive to higher heat and they begin to denature. So plants can adapt to different temperatures based on the type of enzymes they produce. And this is looking at um, the difference between a desert and a coastal population of the same plant. This is a salt bush. Um, and the desert plant um, can Today and oh, oh I, see, I see, I see, okay. Um, the desert plant can maintain a higher photosynthetic rate um, both in what we think of as summer and winter temperatures, and so this is um, you know daily maximum temperature and presumably winter and then presumably summer, uh, where they're very effective at both of those. Where the coastal plant because they're experiencing um, uh, these temperatures where the coastal plant um, is less adapted to those high temperatures. So the desert plant, which generally has higher temperature swings, um, has enzymes that allow it to function better in high temperatures, where the coastal plant 
there's some difference between the these winter temperatures, the cooler temperatures, um, but a much greater difference between the coastal and the desert population when we're looking at the high temperatures. So the desert population is able to function and fix carbon in both a relatively cool temperature, 23 is not really cool, but 43 is quite hot, um, where the coastal populations are not, because they're typically not exposed to really high temperatures because the ocean um, moderates the climate. Um, and the mechanism here is temperatures affecting membrane fluidity. And the loss of fluidity inhibits functioning of pigments, uh, the reason for cold sensitivity in tropical plants. And high temperatures, particularly in combination with intense sunlight, can damage photosynthetic membranes. So again, just think of it as, you know, really just like the slowing down. You can imagine like, uh, in my mind, I typically go like a high sucrose solution that's like kind of freezing and slowing down. And at high temperatures, things are overheating and beginning to, to break. Proteins are beginning to denature. Um, plants need nutrients. So uh, most nitrogen plants is associated with Rubisco and other photosynthesizer, photosynthetic enzymes. So higher nitrogen levels in a leaf are correlated to higher photosynthetic rates. So nitrogens, um, one of the main nutrients, there's a number of micronutrients that are also important, but uh, getting nitrogens important for plants. But if supply of nitrogen is low relative to the demand, um, increasing nitrogen content of the leaves increases risk of being eaten. So um, this is kind of interesting. So what they're saying is plants balance this need for nitrogen with the fact that uh, most herbivores can detect that nitrogen content at that nitrogen level so it makes them more tasty so it's a combination of needing a nutrient to increase productivity but not wanting to just have a big target on your back as being full of nitrogen and the grazers coming to wipe you out um, anything that influences energy gain by photosynthesis it has the potential to affect survival growth and reproduction we're going to talk about these photosynthetic pathways, C3, C4, and CAM. Uh, and C3 and C4 are just named for the number of carbon atoms in the first product. Uh, Rubisco can catalyze two competing reactions. Um, carbooxalase reaction is photosynthesis and the um, oxygen ACE reaction is O2 uptake carbon compounds are broken down into carbon dioxide and that's released via photorespiration. So the, so the um, carboxylase reaction is photosynthesis and the oxygenase reaction is um, the basically you know, part of the respiration system and so they're in some ways, like, well, it says competing, so they're in some ways that they're opposing one another. And the balance between these two reactions depends on the temperature and the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide. Uh, photorespiration increases as carbon dioxide concentration decreases relative to oxygen and temperature increases. Uh, photorespiration results in a net energy loss. So we'll dive into that a little bit more.